Welcome back to Sofa Science. We are actually on a sofa, which is very exciting. And if it looks nice, don't expect this for future videos. It's just because Simon set this up. So hi, Simon. Hello, That's Sally. the casual introduction <laughs> to you. I'm Simon, if you don't know who yeah. I was. Um, so first question, as on all Sofa Sciences, who are you? What's your channel about? Introduce yourself to this lot. So my name is Simon. Uh, I do a PhD in atmospheric physics at the University of Exeter, which Sally's visiting. Which is where we're at at the moment. I'm doing a conference here. This is my house. We just had a really nice dinner. Thank mm. you, housemate Dan. Yeah, who's just really out of lovely frame. dinner. Thank you, Dan. That was um, Dan. Uh, so I'm doing I'm doing my PhD in theoretical atmospheric physics, and my channel started out doing something very different, which was Oxbridge emissions, which I'm guessing we're going to talk about. We're just talking about you and your channel and your life. But like, like at some point, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So I started off doing something different, but now I'm doing videos about um, PhD life. Um, some videos on the science to do with my PhD and um, also moving into doing a more general science stuff in the future. I also do a book club uh, and a vlog about kind of what I've been up to in my life. So I had a meeting with my supervisors yesterday where I just said, you know what guys, this is as good as you're getting for the time being. Um, screw this, I'm going to do some real science now. To which they kind of went, uh, yeah, it's, it's fair and understandable. So I can ignore this and get back to real work. So with that in mind, in this video, what I wanted to talk about was um, the main variable, really, that I'm working with in my thesis and is used a lot in stratosphere and atmospheric sciences generally, which is called potential vorticity, or PV for short. Is there anything you don't do? Rest, sleep. I don't sleep, I just wait. We're, we're gonna get onto that. Okay, so um, I say this like that there is a plan to this video. There isn't. Oh, good. Um, what? got you started what is what is the journey so because you were doing your ma undergrad masters in physics at oxford yeah hence the title simon ox fizz with the extra F. my terrible name can we put that as a graphic can i make you edit this in where we're going to put simon ox fizz can we put the f in bold please well i mean i can stick it as a youtube annotation that's text is really easy to do <sighs> um but before simon gives me any more editing work to do because you know how much i like editing um, so yeah, how did you get started? What's the journey? So I started, um, I basically said, before talking about that, I need to talk about my background. So I went to Oxford from a state school. Mm -hmm. uh, no one in my family had been to university before. Um, I was from a school where nobody had done physics at, at Oxford from my school ever before. So I got in and I sort of, going through the admissions process, I kind of wished that there was somebody I could talk to, like a current student, just to kind of get, cut through the thing, the myths that you hear, like you have to speak Latin, you have to get these GCSEs, these A-levels or whatever. Um, and having gone through the process, I just I could see that there was a gap for stuff to go on YouTube that was offering that kind of advice. But at that time, I think the only Oxford content on YouTube was the Side Business School, which was not admissions related at all. Yeah. So I did a video basically saying, you know, this is my story. This is how I got my journey of getting in. Um, this is some general advice kind of thing. Um, and then people latched onto that and I just sort of started making a few more videos, doing my interview questions and um, frequently asked questions I got in the comments. And eventually sort of the turning point for me doing more regular content was I did a vlog every week during my fourth year. Um, and then that sort of carried on to, and then spread into other content. Because that was vlogging your life. That was, mm. the, the topic was you being a student at Oxford. Yeah, it was, I, I had this theory, which was that um, most of the access which was done by the university was top down. So it was looking at the big facts and the individuals were kind of lost in that view, whereas why I wanted to try and find the complementary view, which was the bottom up approach. So showing just what your daily life is like, because I think if you're applying to university, you want to know what a, a typical day in your life is going to look like. I or mean, a typical that, week. that's great for prospective students to watch, but it means that you suddenly have to decide how much of your personal life you oh, yeah. stop being personal and put into the public eye. And at the time it was, um, it was I wasn't sort of terribly healthy at the time. I was undergoing a, a sort of things like depression and I was, if you watch the videos now, I think if you know that, you can sort of read into the stuff that I say, but I never talked about that. Mm -hmm. I kind of tried to be a bit stiff Phillips about it and not talk about personal life really at all. Um, I generally tend to, I think the rules I gave myself were that you talk about work, you talk about social life, but not personal life. What's the difference between personal and social? Well, when you don't hang around married people, not much. Uh, but uh, generally, sort of the things you get up to, like if you go uh, to Port Meadow, for example, in Oxford, you talk about that rather than talking about my deep innermost feelings. That changed when look, talking about exams, when I was talking about how terrified I was about finals, then I was, that was all game. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. Uh... Am I making more work for you if I swear and you have to bleep it out? Quite possibly. Try oh, not to I might swear then. Good. Try not to swear. Um, from this point on, disclaimer, there will be swearing. There we go. From me. You should join me. 
I mean, I could. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think I've sworn on this channel before. I don't know. Have you? I'd, I'd have a kind of rule on my channel that I don't yeah. swear unless I put it explicitly in the description. I do swear... So I have a second channel which is sort of entertainment-based, which is Spongy and Electric. And that is much more... Because it's an entertainment channel and it's sort of just a bit... It, it, it's not trying to be professional. It's more like my channel. It's more... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Less... No, no, actually, it's better. It's the antithesis, because yeah. you're trying to provide so, low quality, okay, so yeah. high content. So people have been complaining in the comments about my Safer Science series. Just in, about that. In the the quality of production is not good enough. Yeah. The, the whole point of this is that I'm just chatting with my friends to give you something interesting to listen to and what I hope will be some useful advice. But, of course, I can't be bothered, especially if I'm travelling around America, to actually have... Like, we've got a microphone up here, we've got two softbox lights, we've got a camera that's far more expensive than anything that I own. Um, we've got an assistant operating the camera. Oh, yeah. We've got two people watching us in the room, it's a bit weird. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I can't be bothered with that. I'm focusing on the content and not what it looks like, as long as the sound is good enough that you can actually hear it. Whereas my channel was, it's high quality, non-content. Yeah. So it's nonsense presented in a very meaningful way. But that ties back actually to the vlog stuff, mm -hmm. which is that I, when I, I gave a talk about this at AG, so EGU, we did a panel on filmmaking EGU as an academic. EGU being? European Geosciences Union, okay. conference in Vienna, mm -hmm. uh, which was great fun. Um, and we did this panel on being an academic and using video as a little tool. And I, made, I, I like to make the point there that it, when you're doing stuff like this, the quality is part of the product. It's, it's used the filmmaking term, I think it's part of the mise-en-scene. It's, it's the stuff that goes on... It, I think the theatre definition of, of that is everything you see when the curtain goes up. So mm -hmm. it's the audio quality, it's the video the quality, glass the framing, the, the wine glass. But, it, but it's everything <laughs> as well as that. It's like the resolution, it's the F number that you shoot at. It's, it's all these things that contribute to your perception of the content that you're receiving. And if you're trying to do personal content, and me vlogging about my life at Oxford in what was an honest, or well, at least pseudo-honest way, um, you needed to make it low enough quality for it to be believable as a personal product. So you talking to your friends as an honest sort of human interaction that's not staged, you want it to be lower quality. Not staged. You have no idea how long Simon was setting up this. Yeah, no, that setup. that was the last episode. This episode is completely scripted. <laughs> I'm reading from an auto cue right now. Um, talking of auto cue, you, I am always amazed when I'm watching your videos at how well you speak to camera in long takes. Right. Because normally when people are just talking off the cuff, they have to edit it down so that you'll only get about thirty seconds or so between cuts. But you're talking for a long period of time. But having chatted to you about this before, you don't use an auto cue. Uh, I think there's two points about that. The first is I like the sound of my own voice. Uh, so I talk a lot anyway. Yeah. And my mum always used to tell me off for burbling when I was a kid, which always used to annoy me because I was saying very important things as a six year old. Uh, and the second point is that I my background is public speaking. So I was used to, <laughs> we used to do a, a lunchtime debate club um, where you would be given a motion when you arrived or possibly a few days before. And you'd have a very brief amount of time to research and then speak for four minutes. And it had to be smooth. And so more often than not, you'd turn up and you'd have like three points to make and you just had to improvise the speech. Were you, did you have to know yourself when four minutes was up or did someone tell you? Somebody would tell you. Okay. Um, so my sense of timing is definitely off. My videos are always longer than I want them to be. Um, but in terms of me talking, and it also, uh, when people say that I speak, if I speak well on, over long takes, I think what they really mean is that my intonation indicates when something is beginning, when something's the middle, and when something's the end, which is something that I get from doing speeches. Mm -hmm. um, you do, I, when watching especially some of your earlier stuff, you say, and you should go to Oxford for two reasons or five yeah. reasons. And Signpost I'm always stuff. amazed by people who can actually list what they're about to say before they say it. I mean, but by now, my content is so off the cuff when it comes to vlogs that I don't know what I'm going to say before I say it. Yeah. So I'm almost improvising based on the past, like, 30 seconds that I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it's just experience. I've now made so many videos and so many vlogs. I mean, I did, how many would it have been? 20 four and just in my fourth year at Oxford now I've now done 23 X vlogs that so the first series was called Ox vlogs the second series was naturally called Ox X vlogs because I'm an extra um I think there's just I've done so many that you just kind of get used to it and you do you ever script any of your videos some yeah the crash course I did in atmospheric physics I scripted every word um and I scripted every word I did on um how to speak in public 
and a point in that was the fact that halfway through I said, you don't know that I've been speaking from a script. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to make, it's most convincing to sound like you're speaking off the cuff. What are your tips for sounding like you're not reading a script? Is it in the script or is it in the delivery of the script? I think it's both. I think when you're writing the script, you have to speak it out loud. Um, and I also think that when you're um, delivering the script, it's practice. You just have to practice doing it, but you, you have to practice making it sound like you're having these ideas originally you know, as, 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 as they come to you. For people that are thinking of starting making YouTube, would you say to go for the, your approach of high production quality or my approach of whatever production quality you can be bothered to do? Well, I think it depends on what kind of content you're making. Okay. Um, generally, I feel like if, <sighs> you shouldn't view production quality as a barrier to stop you from making content. You should, if you want to make something, don't worry about how it's going to look, just make it. Because the most important way to get better at making videos is to make videos. And, you know, just to, to acquiring a following on YouTube and to get a community going is just to make stuff. People, I mean, if there's one tip, focus on your audio production quality. Make sure that your stuff sounds good. But honestly, don't worry about it. I, 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 if I had to pick one to begin with, I'd say just get your content out there. Make the stuff that you want to make the way that you want to make it within your budget mm -hmm. and with the time that you have. And then... If you want to start investing more time or money into that, then, you know, you're going to start tending towards quality. But, you know, stuff like the hydraulic press channel that's exploded over the past 12 months, I think that started out with pretty, like, it was just like a compact camera on, on like, a book, probably. Like, yeah. not even a proper tripod. Um, people don't start channels uh, with production values from, say, Good Mythical Morning or the Vlogbrothers. Unless they are commercial channels. Yeah, all their sponge in electric, which is high quality, non-content, once a week. Um, what do you think about commercial channels on YouTube? Do you think that they're helping YouTube, hindering YouTube? What, do you mean YouTube the company or the community that's grown up around YouTube? Uh, the, the people on YouTube, so people like you. Do you think it helps that we've got, within science in particular, people like PBS, BBC, Discovery, all of these big businesses and brands that are able to put in the money and the expertise. Well, it certainly works for us as creators in that we get partners to work with and we get opportunities. Yes, it makes us look, our quality look worse by comparison. But again, I think that ties into the point about the, 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 the intangible things about our videos. When people watch our videos, they're not expecting the BBC production values. They're expecting a personal message you know if in, in hearing about a person talking about their phd if they had like a full sound stage and glorious lighting and perfect sound you wouldn't believe what they were saying you'd feel like it was scripted because those kind of production values your brain is telling you means that this is important and people are throwing money at it rather than it being an honest personal perspective so do you ever consciously reduce the quality of your Sometimes, yeah. So sometimes if I'm doing a particularly, per like, um, I did a video recently just asking how people's day was. How people's day, people's plural were. Um, and, is that right? How people's yeah. day went. Yes, we have our English consultant on set. Went, yeah. The production values are so high, we have multiple production <laughs> assistants. Our English consultant says yes. Um, and I did it on my compact, rather than shooting it on a DSLR and rather than getting a whole set. Handheld, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's in the same way, uh, you know, you look at a Hollywood movie and you ask why certain shots are handheld and why certain shots are on a tripod. There's an artistic reason behind that. And I think in our you case, look into cinematography quite a lot. Cinematography oh, yeah. is kind of a big hobby of yours. I've literally got a textbook on it that I'm reading upstairs. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big... I mean, I love film. The reason I think I, I started getting into videos and thought that I could was that a, like a long-term goal for me was to be a movie director. Uh, I love cinema. And was to be a movie director? Is it not still...? I'd love to still be a movie director. It's something that I'm most likely, after finishing my PhD, going to move into media production. That's probably not going to be cinema movie director. Um, it'll probably be a director or producer of, of sorts, slash writer and, you know, create... You know, we're jack of all trades in the age of YouTube. We can do everything. Um, but I would love to do a short film and sort of see where that goes, because... Fiction, documentary... I've got a few ideas. I've got an, an idea for a documentary um, about the Windows X to Cathedral, which is very interesting, and were destroyed. Half of them were destroyed in the Blitz. Well, not the, the Blitz, but the bombing in World War II. Mm -hmm. And they were replaced with just clear glass windows rather than stained glass. Um, I think then there's a master glazer who's been restoring them. So I th 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 I'd love to do that as like a 15 mm -hmm. minute short. But equally, um, I'd love to do some fiction stuff. Everybody wants to make what they consume. 
and I love watching. I don't generally watch documentaries. I have watched an awful lot of very good documentaries that maybe want to do a documentary, but mm -hmm. the bulk of what I watch is fiction. So I'd love to do sort of, you know, ideally I'd do something that was sort of sci-fi if I was to do a feature film. Okay. But yeah, there's the desire to create. And when some of my youngest memories were, were writing scripts for what I'd put into films and stuff like that, which invariably involved Lego and Connects, because that's what I played with as a kid. So do you find that you tend to watch non-science stuff when you're looking for inspiration for your science videos? Um, I don't really look for inspiration for the science videos per se. I, uh, I just sort of how ideas hit me, really. Um, or, for say, for instance, I just came back from playing Zorb football the other day, and that I was playing that and thinking, this would be a great way to display, talk about um, Newton's laws of momentum. And, you know, just that, that's how I do it. I, I didn't get it from watching something, it was sort of just you know from from so it's more experience. experiential yeah definitely much more experiential i mean yes i watch um scientific content like smarter every day or um it's okay to be smart or scishow or whatever and i just think oh, i should have made that why didn't i have that idea uh but it doesn't it, and sometimes there will be something that'll spark off so for instance you're not allowed to steal this idea partly okay. because you know you're not the right are kind of channel not to steal they're not ideal idea you are not allowed to steal this idea okay. um um i was researching what was it that came up? It was something came up about the International Space Station. It was on Reddit. Um, and somebody said, that, is this the most space that's ever been occupied in the International Space Station? Because there are, I think, five spaceships attached to it. And then somebody said, oh, well, that's all going to change in 2020 when they attach this, the, uh, I think it's the BA330 is the designation. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And then it turns out that they're actually, a company called Bigelow or Bigelow Airspace is building an inflatable space station that inflates from a small size to 330 cubic meters of space. Um, and that's one module. And the idea is you stick lots of them together and you can create this huge space hotel. Um, and I just thought that that'd be sort of interesting to look at a, a, the idea of an inflatable space station, mm -hmm. how you, why you do it, how you construct it, when is it happening, that kind of stuff. Um, and that, that was from the, the, the comments in, in a Reddit post, which I think was about a video. Okay. But yeah, it, mostly my ideas tend to be experiential. We haven't actually talked about you going from university vlogs and personal mm. vlogs to science videos. What was the transition there? Um, I think the first science one I did was about how you can make the world's simplest clock, which is two mirrors that you bounce photons off of. and it's um... Isn't the world's simplest clock a sundial? Well, I you suppose. Stick a stick in the ground. In one location it is. <laughs> but the point about having two mirrors that you bounce photons off of is that if you move them, you can derive special relativity. Yeah. Um, and it was a it was a thought experiment by Feynman, and I think it's in his six easy pieces. It's in his lectures for physics. And I just thought, oh, that'll make a cool video. Mm -hmm. I think people that watch my Oxford videos and ask me about what I do in my degree would like that. And I think I also did a brief, because I did a summer research project of my third year summer, and I think I got questions about that. People wanted to learn about what I was doing. So I thought, oh, that's a cool way of doing it. And people liked it, so I just, and I enjoyed making it more importantly. And uh, I think, I've always wanted to emulate the science people that I watched on TV growing up. So people like, do you remember Adam Hart Davis? He did stuff like what the Romans did for us. Yes. Because uh, I met him. God, that was a long time ago. Yeah, and he did, and he did something called um, Science Shack, where he like had to build stuff in his sheds. What, like basic. shed science? Literally like shed science. Uh, and he also did roughs. Oh no, he didn't do rough science. There was a show called Rough Science where they put like three scientists on an island and they were given a task. I like, don't remember that. It was like make gunpowder. Mm -hmm. And so like, a chemist would be like, right, we need to get bat dung. We need to get this. Yeah. And, you know. So I kind of wanted to emulate those. And I was, I, I guess making those, that first video was a case of, oh, I, I enjoyed doing that. People enjoyed watching it. So let's start doing that kind of thing. And you already had the audience from your vlogs. Yeah, it was quite small at the time. I think it was less than 10,000 subscribers, but it was enough for me to feel like I had impetus to do it. Um, and then since then, I haven't done a huge number of science videos yet. I've generally included it whilst talking about my PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done a crash course in atmospheric science, and I'm working on another crash course at the moment. So I think I've, I, I seem to have shifted into more of those formal ideas, but I have had all these little ideas to do as standalone videos. At the moment, it's just time. We're both in a similar kind of stage in our yeah. PhD where we spend too much time on YouTube and not enough time in the lab slash writing up. Yeah. Um, and so once I finish my PhD, I, I kind of told myself that I'll spend like six months making that kind of content and just sort of seeing where it takes me and if it takes off. Um, because I want to make those kind of videos. They are fun to do, as I'm sure you know, you'd agree. They, do you find, which do you, what of your content do you find the most fun to do? 
of all the stuff I make. Yes. Um, Sponge and Electric, which I do with our English consultant. Do you want to reference this again? We're trying to gain subscribers, guys. <laughs> um, I mean, that's obviously fun because it's an entertainment channel. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, on it, your channel? On my channel, I love the interactions that I get from the book club that I do. Okay. That's not so much making it as it is... Um, the community stuff that you get as a result of it. In terms of making it, I do like doing the science stuff and talking about my PhD because you have to think, in order to truly understand what either of us are doing, you have to have done a degree in the relevant field, you have to have done two odd years of specialised study doing this exact thing for about nine to five, three to four days a week. Uh, and, you know, so you can't expect a general audience to ex understand it as is. So you have to convert it. And well, for you, maybe. Well, you know, so I, I can't just talk about quasi geostrophic potential vorticity inversion in the middle atmosphere. That's no, going to be can't. nothing. I have to say, you know, it's like a football being telling you where the position of the footballers are. Mm -hmm. It's 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 the thought process of how can I make this simpler without losing any of the information, and how can and what preconcept what what sort of uh, knowledge does the audience already have? What can I assume? Um, how can I tell this? Um, Who are your audience? Generally, I view my audience as sort of motivated. Um, uh, School students, specifically those who want to go to Oxbridge, because I still get a lot of questions about that. Um, A-level students in particular, um, and sort of undergraduate students, I think. And then there is That's a growing who number of people. you aim at, but who are you actually reaching? Oh, um, 18 to 25 is, okay. is sort of the key demographic. Um, most 60% male, 40% female. That is the highest percent female of anyone I've spoken to yet. Can you blame them? <laughs> uh, oh, our production assistant behind the camera is not happy about that. <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, th yeah, that's kind of how I'm reaching, and the, and the comments that I get, largely international, I think, in terms of all the comments I get, or it might just be that international students are more likely to comment. Mm -hmm. um, do you like your audience? Do they have a <laughs> I can't say no. <laughs> no, no, but do they have, like, a, I, th I feel like different audiences have different personalities. Yeah, they're great. I was like, we were going through some comments earlier today, actually, on my channel, um, and some of them of doing Oxbridge stuff, you do get occasional people that will label you as being you know, somebody who are claiming not to be, you're actually posh and, you know, mm. you had all the advantages in life and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, you just get used to. For the most part, the people that comment on my videos are making insightful comments. They actually engage in the discourse. Um, you get people that are, you feel like they're like you, you know, they're switched on to the world. They want to learn more. And so what they will ask for further links to read stuff. Um, they'll say, oh, thank you for talking about that um, and actually give constructive criticism. Um, the the vast vast majority of my audience are great. You do get the occasional person who just sort of look at their comment and go, "Why have you said that?" What kind of comments are they usually? Oh, not mean comments. Just a case of just weird comments. Okay. Um, you do you do get strange people on the internet like us, um, and you know they make, they make YouTube comments, and sometimes they're just a little bit. You just sort of leave them be and, and let them be alone. Do you moderate your comments? A no, lot? because you do have quite a young audience compared to most other people. You are trying to reach people who are still at school. Yeah, um, I don't moderate um, beyond if there's anything blatant, sort of hate speech, inciting violence, that kind of stuff, then I'll get rid of it. Um, and what, what in your content do you filter? Yeah, I, so I don't swear on stuff on the main channel. Um, I generally, generally speaking, I mean, I'm... I'm, I suppose I'm a bit like a millennial, if we're allowed to use that word, you know, in that I like co mainstream content at the moment, you know, Marvel movies, um, sort of maybe some ma elements of mainstream music. So when you're talking about stuff and you're making analogies, you use that common vocabulary that mm -hmm. you feel you have with your audience. Um, uh, you know, I moderate it in the sense that I target it to that sense. I also don't talk about my personal life, you know, my relationships, for example, um, I, I generally try and keep a pretty firm line over that kind of stuff. Don't talk and don't, um, don't show people if they don't want to be shown, you know, be, be understanding to your friends mm -hmm. as well. And, and that, that does get interesting when you do things like going to Malta on Chapel Choir Tour and you're surrounded by people. I was going to ask how, cause you're vlogging your life. The reason that I don't vlog my life is because none of my friends want to be in my videos. I mean, I happen to live with our English consultant who um, is a bit of a video nut. And mm -hmm. I'm very lucky in that we're now going to be able to make content together and we don't have to worry about doing house content because it's all cool. My last house that I lived with were less keen on being on video. And that was always a sort of kind of friction. You know, if you're filming, make sure they're not around, which is just common courtesy. It wasn't mm -hmm. a problem. Um, um, but generally, because, like in my personal life, 
I am mostly on my own in my videos. That's really sad. <laughs> um, well, I'm a physicist, for goodness <laughs> sake. Um, so, you know, I, I'm making content that is solo. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know. You're riding solo. I'm like, I'm like a cam girl. Solo. Um, uh, you know. <laughs> that was not where I was going with Jason to reload. Oh, oh, uh, I, I thought your mind was going to darker places than no. it was. You know, I'm, I'm like a cam girl. I'm mostly doing things on my own with encouragement from the audience. Um, so I don't really have to worry about other people being in it unless I've already arranged with them to be part of the content. Okay, sorry, I'm still <laughs> reeling in my head. Swiftly changing topic. We're accepting tokens. P I don't even know what that is. Um, PhD watch. Yes. This is you vlogging about your PhD. Yeah. One of the things I find odd. Is me. me well, one of the many things I find odd is that you're talking about your work as you're doing it. Because within biology, hmm. we don't want to talk about our work until we've published. And I know a lot of people watching this have commented on my videos, for God's sake, Sally, tell us what it is you're doing with these flies whenever I mention <laughs> the flies. They're like, why are you doing this? Tell us more about the science of it. I'm like, I can't because I haven't published yet. Yeah. But you're like, I've done this equation this week, or well, I'm working on that. When I've I, I think the exception is sometimes I, tw I have tweeted one or two pictures of, of derivations I've worked on, which have all invariably have been later shown to be wrong. So I've yet to cause a problem. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, I mean, generally the stuff I talk about in my videos, it's, it's an idea, um, the hypothesis that we're working with, um, that's not really new. It's, it's been in the literature, but it's yet to be properly studied. I get the impression that if an academic were to stumble across my videos by, you know, getting lost on YouTube, they would say, oh, he's working on that thing. I wonder what he's going to find, rather than, oh, I should totally steal that idea. Because it's, you know, these ideas have already been in the literature. Um, I haven't talked about specific, like the real specifics of what I'm doing, kind of for the same reason, although I'm nowhere near publishing a paper just yet. Um, I guess I'm trying to avoid that problem further down the line. But I've yet to kind of consciously sense to say, oh, don't show them that yet. I think I've just had this kind of idea in my mind, talk about the general concepts. Okay. Does uh, your supervisor watch your videos? Does he know that you're making videos? He knows. I, she, I interviewed, I I've say. interviewed him. It is a him. Um, uh, for my, I did a series on COP21, the, the Conference of Parties, or Council of, Conference of Parties, okay. which was the most recent climate talk. I was going to say, that was a big climate change thing. Um, when those videos, those videos got literally tens of views. Wow. Uh, well, no, they got a few hundred. It, they weren't terribly successful because people don't care about the climate, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, but he has been in some, so he knows I make videos. I don't think he watches them. Okay. Um, I have I have had this thing with authority figures. So, for example, when I was in Oxford at my college, the I made a YouTube channel for my college, which was SPC Oxford, St Peter's College, and um, the Person's master. Jobs is better. Some would say, um, the uh, and the master of the college didn't know about it. He found out about it through his son, who watched the videos on YouTube, and said, "Oh yeah, the YouTube channel you set up is really cool." Yeah. Which was you know nice, but I think it's the same kind of deal with my supervisor. He just sort of doesn't really watch them. Does he know that you don't want to be an academic? Um, well, I'm not ruling out the idea of an academic. If a postdoc were to turn up mm -hmm. uh, and to say, we love what you've done with your PhD, <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, we want you to continue it, um, then I'd be open to the idea. I just feel like media's... I feel like I'm drawn to it more. Okay. We have talked about it a bit, what we do, and he had said that I would, I could be sort of going for lectureships in, in the future and I could be an academic. He said, albeit a somewhat unconventional one. You spend a lot of time yeah. um, not on your PhD doing <laughs> things like making these videos. Because these videos, I often chat to you and you're like, oh, I, I'm so busy tonight because I've got this video to make and this video to make. And it obviously eats into time that we would otherwise spend doing your PhD. Well, I don't think that, because I generally try and keep a nine to five. Okay. So I wouldn't be working the PhD in my night time. Well, I think I spend my time in the, when most normal people would be doing socialising or watching TV or, or whatever, I turn, kind of tend to make videos or sing. Okay. Because that's the other big time sink. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yes, it does eat, and sometimes it eats into the day because I will be, I don't know, I was in Reading recently and I was filming for two days doing experiments. I mostly I did give a talk while I was there and I met some professors and all that kind of stuff. But um, sometimes it does eat into the day. It doesn't like affect my kind of daily hours any more than I feel like r rampant procrastination does already. Okay. Um, which sometimes is aided by being on social media for my channel and mm -hmm. justifying and replying to comments sometimes. Um, you know, I might take an hour out maybe and yeah. you know, reply to comments or messages, but 
I don't think it actually impacts my PhD as much as maybe I make people think it does. Okay. Which is good. So yeah. If my supervisor, if you're watching. Do you feel judged by academia? Do you feel when you're talking? No, about I, I've been I've been lucky actually in that the people in my office seem to think it's sort of it's, it's just what I do. It's you know it's, it's nice that it is done. Mm -hmm. And equally uh, at the EGU, the conference in Vienna, um, we you know there was a whole panel about filmmaking, and they actually have a prize for scientific filmmaking, I think sort of video making, um, which they're trying to push and make more people do it. Um, and so I've yet to experience the proper stigma. The, 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 though, interestingly, I'm, I was working on a project recently, um, two people, one being me, one being another PhD student um, in Archaeology Exeter. We both shot a day in the life and I was editing them together. And she said that actually she just done, ended up not telling her supervisor that she was doing it because he would have said that she shouldn't because it wasn't a befitting of an academic or, you know, whatever. Um, that's been the only sort of direct contact I've had with people belittling and sort of putting down making these kind of videos mm -hmm. i've been i've been very lucky and my supervisor has been quite supportive and I, as have the other academics at exeter you know they've been very willing to be sort of appear on video and talk about this stuff so that's so the support from the kind of the real life side of things from the audience side of things you say that they're very inquisitive mm. but is there anything that really pisses you off in terms of because i know that in the past People were commenting on what, what kind of t-shirts you're wearing, for example. <laughs> My nipples are behind bars, everybody. <laughs> like, is that a regular thing, or was that just a one-off, or is... Oh, well, I embraced that one. Okay. That was that was the one where I ended up... I, I, I wore a couple of tops that were probably a bit too tight for me, and people kept commenting, like, uh, like um, uh, just, like, nipples and stuff like that. So eventually I ended up making a vlog where I was just wearing the tightest top I owned, and, like, really, like, getting them up and worked before. So they were really <laughs> standing to attention. Um, in terms of what annoys me, um, I've gone beyond being annoyed about people sort of putting down the whole Oxbridge thing mm -hmm. and saying you're a public school twat and all that kind of stuff. Um, on my current content, I think what, what annoys me is people that ask questions that are so clearly Googleable. The questions that when I answer them, I just type their question into Google. You go into, what's it, um, L M G T. F1. Let me Sorry, Google that, let for, me you. Google that yeah. for you. I've never replied with that. I've always been like, oh yeah, the, the emissions for this particular course are this. Oh, I'm so passive aggressive. I have sometimes replied to people with that. <laughs> or, or, or equally, people that haven't watched the video. Somebody commented on my um, Oxford FAQs video where I talk about my GCSEs and what results I got and you know how that affected getting to Oxbridge. And they commented on the video saying, what GCSEs did you get? I was like, I, I literally put a graphic up showing what subject I did and what, what result I got in each subject. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're going to engage with somebody on YouTube, perhaps, and ask a question, perhaps check that that question isn't Googleable or isn't answered in the video that you're commenting on. Um, that's the only stuff that gets to me at the moment, is people being idiots. Okay. <laughs> so it's, 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 yeah, it, it's... Warning to anyone about to write a comment. <laughs> yeah, watch the whole thing, watch all this engaging content. This long, unedited version. With big caps in the middle where the camera yeah. stopped recording. Um, what, on that point, would you like the audience to know that you don't think they already know about you, your YouTube, your science, I'm, your channel? I'm a very tender lover. Um, I feel like the audience needs to know that. Um, well, they didn't already know <laughs> Can that. Can I just point out that the other two people in the room just went... <laughs> <laughs> um, one of them knows it's not true. <laughs> not. <laughs> um, uh, uh, what do I want them to know about me? Um... I don't know, I feel like I've kind of put my life on YouTube. Uh, all the stuff that I'm comfortable talking about is already out there if you want to watch my videos. Because that's something, you made a draw my life. I did do a draw my life, Because you were yeah. talking about how in your Oxford vlogs you wouldn't talk about things that were going wrong, or like depression and things like that. Mm. And then draw my life happened. Yeah, and people were kind of shocked about... I know. mean, if there was ever oversharing... That it would be that video. I'm not saying you necessarily were, but it was such a contrast to how much well, you've been sharing. Because previously. I think it was a conversation that needed to happen. I feel like the mental health side of Oxford is, you know, uni generally um, is, you know, needs to be talked about. And Oxford in particular is so high stress. Um, in fact, I did a series of videos basically because of the response to that um, about mental health at university. I just felt like it was really necessary. And um, I, I think if I was to be... Uh, Make a video, there was no point being pseudo honest about my life, I had to be honest. Do you um, regret it? I regret the fact that I didn't talk to my parents about all that stuff beforehand. They didn't, oh, wow. They didn't know. 
um, because we don't talk about feelings in our family. Do your uh, parents usually watch the videos? Yeah, they watch everything. So you made it knowing that they would end up watching Well, them. I have to admit, I forgot. And I just sort of assumed that they kind of would maybe forget that bit. And I had a, I had a very emotional phone call with them after it went out. Um, because yeah, they, they had no idea about all the sort of stuff that got, I think they knew that I was in trouble, um, emotionally, but they didn't know quite how bad it was. And they blamed themselves that, you know, they were, they were talking about the fact that they should have picked up on the signs. Mm -hmm. I feel like what I did was a very good act, that everything was absolutely fine. You know, um, that's, that's the regret that I have from that. I wish that I talked to them about it beforehand and I was just sort of forgot that we didn't talk about it. Do you feel like your YouTube persona is an act? Or do you try, do you consciously put on a persona when you're doing it? I definitely YouTube? changed my voice. Okay. You've already pointed this out. When I'm, when I'm not on camera and I'm this kind of calm, debonair, elegant, suave talker, um, I'm actually, I'm actually very jittery and I fidget and I, I can't stay still for very long. And I kind of abandon sentences halfway through. Your body language on. is very different. Um, because it is an act. I feel, I feel like, um, um, I think this ties into this idea called actor network theory, which was like... Dumb. Do you want to say that again without your hands in front of your mouth? I think, called, <laughs> I think, it, was, I think it was called actor network theory, um, which is this idea that, you know, sort of people... Interactions between people are done via acts, you know, via facades that you put okay. up. And I feel like on YouTube, in particular, you, you form an act that you feel represents things that you identify with. So I put I would put on an act of student, scientist, geek, singer, um, all that kind of stuff, which you feel like are the components of you that your audience buys into. And I feel like everybody does that to a certain extent. Um, some people are much less so than others. I'm pretty moderate about it. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that my, my real life self is slightly different, not hugely different. I'm not, I am actually a student. For one thing um and i am meant to be doing a phd um but you know all, all the, the bulk stuff is there perhaps i accentuate it a little bit more okay. and i leave out the fact that when i i normally talk i swear a lot mm -hmm. um not that much not that much um it tends to be dependent on the situation <laughs> um but yeah there are certainly bits of my personality that i omit okay um yeah maybe that have shone through in this video more than in the probably stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah what video are you proudest of Ooh, um, the Draw My Life video got people talking about stuff and I got lots of really great feedback about people who said, I'm now going to go talk to my campus mental health services. And I feel like that's the one that had the most positive impact. Same for the videos I did about mental health, you know, similar comments, people saying that, you know, this is now something that I'm thinking about. Um, I feel like perhaps the video that made the most contribution, well, there's two videos. The, first, the video that perhaps they made the most important contribution to the discourse was um, Our Oxbridge Admissions Fair. Because I feel like that put information out that people weren't necessarily exposed to. And based certainly on the feedback in the comments and on the like to dislike ratio, it seemed to be effective in convincing people that this is the way that Oxbridge Admissions works. I feel like um, the video that's had the most impact to people full stop is my How to Study Effectively video. Just because it's reached so many people, it's been shared all over the place and you know got lots of really great feedback. Um, and it's the message that I wish I'd been given at the start of, you know, sixth form or GCSEs. Is the number of views or the comments more important to you? Comments, definitely. Okay. Views are nice, don't get me wrong, um, but um, it's more important to see the tangible impact that you've had on people. A, a, a number going up by one is much less important than a comment from somebody saying that you've made a big difference. Definitely. Okay, and kind of inspired by your How's Your Day Going video, do you have a question for my audience? So bear in mind these How are... do you put up with her? Honestly, we've been with her for like three hours tonight and it's been dreadful. Lovely food though. Lovely food. Really lovely food here. Um, One question for your audience. About, about what? About anything. Like, this is your opportunity to ask these people a question. I mean, I know that they're not your audience, but is there anything you'd like to know from them? I'm not going to ask them about their day again because that was a terrible, terrible idea. I had to reply to a thousand comments. Well, I won't be replying to all the comments, but... Um... Uh, yeah, so, so which one of your, your favourite YouTubers <laughs> loves you more? That's what you should take from that. Um, what question? I don't know, I feel like that's such a broad field. Well, it is. 
Um, Partly because the answer that you choose shows your priorities. <laughs> yeah. But like many of these questions. Oh, it's, it's, the it's, it's a sugared you, trap. The route you go down says a lot about you. Um, tell me about your audience. If they can't tell me, you know. Uh, male. Very male. Um, they are primarily, what are the age brackets? 20 to 25, 25 to 35, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they are intellectual, geeky, um, quite a lot of them from Rooster Teeth. Um, they tend to be very nice people. I'm not going to lie. I think I do have one of the nicest audiences, certainly within science YouTube, because they're the ones whose comments I check most regularly. Mm. Um, a few weirdos. But uh, generally, they're pretty nice. Right, with my audience, if you're watching, turn on them now. Now is the moment. <laughs> Murder them in the comments. Based on the fact that we have a male audience, and I'm not used to such a large male percentage mm -hmm. in the audience, um, I feel like, the, based on sort of what we've been talking about, the most important issue that I'd want to learn about is if you have gone to university um, and you, you had a period like me of going through negative mental health, you were, you, were, you were struggling with something, whatever it may be, and if you're comfortable talking about it, put that in the comments, talk about your experience, and whether you went to your campus mental health services, and if you didn't, why you didn't? Because there's a, there's a definite stubbornness, and I, I, I phrased that particularly because you said it was male, mm -hmm. there's a definite stubbornness about men saying we don't need help. Yeah. We, are, we are this rugged, this concept of rugged masculinity. We are self-sufficient. We take what we need from the land and we don't need any, you know, head doctors um, to make us right. We just sort of suck it up. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an idea that, you know, maybe works for 99% of people, but for some people it's not good. Mm -hmm. it's, even, yeah. it's people who will need support and mental health services are there for a reason. And they are underused despite the fact that they're oversubscribed. Um, and particularly for men. Male mental health is a particular problem. Yeah. And people are always saying, oh, why are you only ever talking about female problems? But male... In because men don't talk about their problems. Well, but, but in particular, it's... Um, women have other problems, but mental health is a particularly bad one for men. Yeah. And I was a classic example of sort of stiff upper lip, don't ask for help, snap all of a sudden. Well, yeah. I wasn't... I was, I was sort of warping, and then all of a sudden I just was, you know in a very, very bad place. So I wish I'd gone to mental health services, but I didn't. And I think the reason I didn't was because I grew up in a militaristic family, well, a military family, both my parents are military. We didn't talk about feelings, so I didn't think it was right for me to go, and I, I shouldn't have gone, so I didn't. And I feel like that was stupid, and I really should have rusticated, taken a year out, and then I would have gone much better in my degree. Um, so that's why I didn't. I'd want to know if you perhaps had a similar thing to me, maybe why you didn't. I think that's that's a discourse that we can start and it'd be really worthwhile having. I was going to end it roughly around here, but I feel like this is kind of like psychotherapy, like going deep into your feelings. I mean, it's good that you're talking about it. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, I can... I can um, do you remember when you did reports on science experiments in school and yeah. you had hypothesis data... or no, hypothesis methodology data, yeah. um, analysis... or no, conclusions, and then you had your... Um, um, evaluation. Yes. This is the evaluation at the end of the video. Okay. Well, how, we... how do you feel the video went? Oh, um, I probably wouldn't watch it. If I was in the audience, I would have turned off a long time ago. Was there anything you would have included or not included? Is there anything you feel like you haven't said? I feel like you should subscribe to Spongy and Electric, which is my second channel, and Simon Oxford. There is going to be links once the videos are up. I am, yeah. we are going to be in more videos together whilst I'm here in Exeter. We're doing that YouTube collaborating. We are, mostly just that they've got a really nice house and it's quite stressful being at a conference so I'm kind of enjoying having a living room and just chilling with friends. Um, so yeah, so there are going to be links to all the different places where you can go. Um, where are all your social media links? What's, what is your... So I'm on, I'm on, right. Things. Okay. The YouTube's the main one. I'm yeah. Simon Oxfizz, as in Simon Oxford Physics. Oxfizz. Uh, I am on uh, Twitter as that, I'm on Instagram as that, I'm on Facebook as YouTube Simon, all one word, and I'm on Goodreads as just Simon Clark. Because Favourite social media site? Twitter. Okay. I, it's difficult because they're, they're good at different things. Mm -hmm. I like Twitter because it's the probably the one... You want Snapchat? No, because I'm old. Okay, I just joined Snapchat. Like oh, did you? How are you finding it? It's odd. I have yet to find something that works on Snapchat that doesn't work on Instagram. 
And I've never done any video I have on yet to find anything on Instagram that doesn't work on Twitter. Yeah, like, Twitter is the app that if I'm just sort of... If my brain is in neutral and I'm just on my phone, I will just... Gravi- my thumb will gravitate towards Twitter and you'll just see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it's sort of it's like the pulse of the world. I like it. You feel connected when you're on Twitter in a very addictive, dangerous way. Um, and on that note, uh, go and follow Simon Go outside, on read a book, play in a park, get off the internet. <laughs> Go on, Pokemon Go. You've had enough for today. Comment first and, you know, like and subscribe. Subscribe, and, subscribe, and subscribe to me and subscribe yeah. to Sally if you haven't already. But then go outside. You've had enough internet for one day. There we go. And on that note, bye-bye and see you for the next Sofa Science. Goodbye.